All right, thank you everyone for joining us today and taking the time to come visit PCL Southwest Medical Center. Um, we're excited today to announce that cardiologists with PCL Southwest Medical Center and the Vancouver Clinic are the first in our region to offer groundbreaking new device for the treatment of atrial fibrillation. Uh, which affects more than 5 million Americans. And first, Dr. Rice will tell us a little bit about uh, the significance of the Watchman implant. Thank you. <clears throat> the device itself is a big step forward for us in terms of our treatment of atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation, as many people know, is a chronic problem which is growing as our population ages. The big problem with atrial fibrillation is really the risk of stroke. Now with this technology, we're able to implant a device which will, after 45 days, will allow patients to stop their anticoagulation, still reducing the risk of stroke. It's a very big step forward for us. We're very excited about it, not only because it's a device that we'll be able to use soon and really help patients who can't or shouldn't be on blood thinners, but it's also one more step forward for us in bringing new technology to the area. So we're certainly glad to bring it here, and I'd like to introduce Dr. John, who's going to talk a little bit more about atrial fibrillation. Thank you, James. Um, I guess my uh, goal is to just express the overall um, prevalence of atrial fibrillation within the, the population. Um, I'm sure many people that watch mm -hmm. this either themselves or will have some yeah. family member that's been affected. Um, it's thought that over 5 million Americans now have atrial fibrillation. Uh, in the next 20 years, that'll be up to 16 uh, million, particularly as the population uh, ages. It's assessed that one in four individuals over the age of 40 uh, will have atrial fibrillation. Now, the, the rhythm is itself uh, is not in particular a dangerous uh, arrhythmia, uh, and I express this to my uh, patients, but where the, the disability and uh, potentially mortality come from it uh, is ri the risk of stroke. Uh, and that's something I emphasize very strongly with my uh, patients. If you do anything about atrial fibrillation or your atrial fibrillation, you need to ensure that you're appropriately protected from it, of the risk of stroke. Now that varies from individual to in individual, and thankfully with uh, advent of uh, new drugs and technology, including the Watchmen. Over the last 10 years, we've been able to offer much more options to uh, individuals. Um, this is a big step because uh, anticoagulation is not for everybody. Um, uh, even with the newer agents, there is still a risk of bleeding. Um, this is a step forward uh, to carry up to or treat potentially up to 50% of individuals who are not appropriately treated for their stroke risk. So with that all. Hand you over to Dr. Lowry to explain the device. Good morning. Uh, nice to see all of you. So we've talked a little bit about atrial fibrillation, but probably I should take a step back and explain to you why people with atrial fibrillation have strokes. And I have a small heart model here. I was hoping to be able to show you a video, and there'll be a thumb drive if any of you are interested that'll show uh, the anatomy and how we do the procedure in a little more detail. But this is a model of the heart, and what I want to draw attention to is this little pouch on the left upper chamber of the heart. It's called the left atrial appendix. It really serves no great useful purpose. We kind of think of it like the appendix of the heart. It just kind of causes problems. Well, in people in normal rhythm, that little pouch, if my fingers are that pouch, in normal rhythm, that pouch is squeezing completely and pushing all the blood out. But when people go, people go into atrial fibrillation, their upper chambers are beating very rapidly, sometimes three to 400 times a minute. And that pouch is just kind of sitting there quivering. And what can happen is blood pools in that pouch and can form clots, and those clots can break free. And if those clots travel to the brain, they cut off blood flow to the brain, and that causes a stroke. Well, the treatment that we've had for years and years, and, and it's well tested and reliable, is to use blood thinners. Oral blood thinners, the one we've used before, is Coumadin or Warfarin. Uh, there are newer blood thinners out there that a lot of people have heard about. Um, that approach is very good, and it's very good for a lot of people, but conceptually what we're doing is we're thinning out the blood throughout the body to treat what's really a focal problem in that little pouch. And again, 
the risk of using blood thinners is the risk of bleeding. So whenever we put somebody on a blood thinner, we increase their risk of bleeding, including bleeding types of strokes. So as we're trying to prevent blood, oops, blood clots from forming, we are also introducing a risk of bleeding, including bleeding types of strokes. So this has led to a lot of interest in a way to just prevent blood clots from forming in that pouch, which could potentially eliminate the need for taking blood thinners long term. And this has led to the FDA approving this device called the Watchman device. And the idea behind this Watchman device is we can go up and we can essentially seal off that pouch. And over about 45 days, that pouch will completely close off. No pouch, no blood clots. Now people can, take, can come off these uh, oral blood thinners. And so the way that we implant this device is relatively non-invasive. We just go up through the blood vessel in the leg. We start out by going into the right upper chamber of the heart, and then we have some techniques to get into this left upper chamber where this pouch is. And then this catheter or tube gets advanced into the heart. And again, we've got a nice video to show you guys uh, uh, if you're interested. And then once this tube is situated in that pouch, we deploy this little device, which I'm going to show you here. It comes out like a parachute. And that little pouch, that, that little device, now sits inside the opening to that pouch and seals it off. Procedure takes about 45 minutes to an hour. Patients usually stay in the hospital overnight. Most of them go home the next day. And again, they have to be on blood thinners for at least 45 days while this is all sealing in and healing up. But after that, we know over 90% of people will get off these blood thinners long term. And we know from very good studies that their risk of stroke is the same or less than if they're taking a blood thinner. So again, we're very excited. We are uh, the only center between Seattle and potentially Sacramento that's going to have this. Uh, just to give you an idea, there are no centers currently in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Stanford's starting their program the same time we are. And so we're really thrilled to be able to offer this, not just to our local community, but really to the Northwest at large. Um, finally, I would say why Peace Health? Um, what I would tell you, this is not new for us. We've brought other new technologies to the community. The first leadless defibrillator was done at our center. So uh, what I would tell you is this is just another offering that we have, and I would commend Peace Health for supporting us, for supporting the physicians so we can bring this technology to, uh, to our community and uh, not just locally but in the surrounding areas. Great. Thank you. And if there are any further questions, feel free to ask. Are there certain types of patients who would really benefit from this that are kind of the ideal patient to, to have this procedure? That's a great question. Again, blood thinners are really good for a lot of people. We know that certain risk factors risk, increase people's risk of bleeding and people who've had bleeding. So patients who had, who've had bleeding before but need to be on blood thinners to protect them from stroke. Those would be really good patients that could benefit from this. Patients who may have high risk uh, professions, say a police officer who's really worried about being on blood thinners, um, that would be a person that could benefit from that. Uh, in the end, you know, the FDA was pretty broad in who they, they said we could implant this in. Really it was anybody who needs to be on one of these blood thinners and has a good reason not to be on a blood thinner could qualify for this. plans for the first patients? Like, do you mind discussing plans for the first patients? Yeah, absolutely. Our first implants are tentatively scheduled for October 29th. Um, one of the things is we're doing this as a team, which I think is relatively unique. Some of the other centers have one implanter that does it. We've been working, again, Peace Health and the Vancouver Clinic. Uh, we have uh, our anesthesia uh, team members. This is done under a special type of ultrasound. So again, like I said, it's been a big collaborative effort. And, and again, we're very excited about bringing this. And I think we'll, we'll um, offer it in a way that will be really unique in terms of uh, being safe, effective, and again, working as a team to make sure our patients have the best outcomes. Any idea how, how many of these you expect to be doing or how popular you expect this procedure to be? 
Boy, that's a great question. I mean, really, the FDA just approved it in the spring, so I think there have been a total of 1,200 total in the entire country. Um, again, we're going to try and be pretty selective in who, who we offer this to. I, my other colleagues can, can jump in this as well. But um, uh, like I said, nobody likes being on blood thinners, and we know that a lot of these patients who need to be on blood thinners are elderly and have other risks for bleeding. So I anticipate this will be, you know, you know, really ground bait breaking in terms of this treatment. It's been around in Europe for about eight years, actually, and uh, it's been very well accepted. Question. Omar, so the opposite of what I asked earlier, are there certain patients who would not be good candidates for this procedure? Um, you guys want to? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the risk of stroke um, related to atrial fibrillation is um, very dependent on the individual. And so there are some individuals that are at very low risk. So say a man in his 50 who has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the risk of stroke per year is far less than 1% that actually current guidelines say that they wouldn't really need anything. Um, so you really have to have a yearly risk of stroke that is around 2% or uh, above. Uh, and we have good risk scores based on the individual determining who is going to be appropriate candidate for anticoagulation. As we also have very good risk, um, historical risk scores of uh, knowing who's going to be at higher risk of bleeding. And, and so it's going to be a combination of those two risk scores that will be um, utilized to kind of predict who's going to be the best option for this. I would only add that there are patients who have to be on blood thinners for other reasons, yeah. irrespective of whether they have atrial fibrillation. And unfortunately, we can reduce their risk of stroke, but we can't reduce their need for a blood thinner. And the last group I would say is currently you have to be able to take warfarin for 45 days after the implant while it's healing. There are some clinical studies that we'll probably be participating in taking patients who can't be on any blood thinners and still may benefit from the device. But um, currently that would only be in a research protocol. So if you can't take blood thinners at all, you can't, be, you can't get this device right now.